Sue, so, um, I'm going to be doing a talk and it's an intro to NFC, um, near field communications. Uh, very quickly, a little about, a bit about me. My name is Robert Portfleet. I'm a senior consultant with Foundstone. Um, spoke here last year, uh, Brad Antonowitz and I did a talk on uh, we're driving the 4.9 gigahertz uh, public safety band. That was, that was awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I really, I really it means a lot to me. Um, uh, so let's see, uh, what do I do? Um, I'm a pen tester, I do network wireless web app pen testing. Um, I kind of have like a focus on wireless. Um, I keep trying to get away from it, but I keep getting dragged back in, like Michael Corleone. Um, I teach Foundstone's uh, Ultimate Hacking Wireless class. I've taught it at Black Hat the last three years. Uh, and I do a fair bit of wireless research uh, in my spare time. Uh, I'm a fairly frequent contributor to the Open Security Research blog. Uh, if you guys don't get a chance to read it, um, you get a lot of really good contributors to it, and uh, there's a lot of really great stuff on there. And if you guys want to, uh, you know, ask me any questions, uh, my email's there and my Twitter address. Um, so, you know, feel free. Uh, I'll put it up again at the end. Um, always happy to talk wireless stuff. So, you know, feel free to uh, ping me anytime. And, uh, you know, you may get more discussion than you want. Sometimes I just don't know when to shut up. Uh, but on that note, uh, we'll move forward. Um, so what we're going to talk about is we'll do a little bit of an intro, you know, to basically what's NFC, how do you use it, you know, what's it used for practically, uh, a little bit about the protocols involved. Um, then we'll talk about, you know, what hardware uh, is involved in terms of the chipsets, uh, secure elements that are used, um, and, you know, also what NFC adapters would be most useful to you to do some NFC hacking, right? Um, then we'll talk about some of the software that's uh, used for set hacking. Uh, and then some of the attacks that have been done so far against the NFC. So what is NFC? Uh, near field communications. Uh, basically, it's a set of standards for uh, communicating uh, between either two mobile devices, generally it would be mobile devices, um, or a device in a tag, or actually a mobile device acting as a tag where, you know, in, in the interest of mobile payments, as we were just discussing, uh, you would hold your phone up to a uh, NFC reader at a Starbucks or Home Depot or what have you, and the reader would read your card and access your bank account, uh, read your phone rather, access your bank account, and you'd be able to make a payment. Uh, as you can see, it's very short range. Um, I've heard claims of 10 centimeters, but uh, typically you're probably under four centimeters, probably closer to two. Uh, when you transfer data between two mobile devices, typically you'll place them back to back, uh, touching each other. Uh, the frequency is 13.56 megahertz, which is the high frequency band uh, in RFID. Um, it's also used by the uh, NXP MyFair, which is actually uh, MyFair built mostly on the um, NFC uh, compliance standards. Uh, things like Visa's um, or Master, um, yeah, Visa's PayPass, uh, ePassports, and uh, HID's iClass uh, cards, which actually fall under what's known as NFCV or NFC vicinity. Um, these are uh, uh, access control uh, cards for getting into buildings and such. Uh, you can also see the data rates are fairly slow, uh, 106, 212, or 424 kilobits per second. Um, generally, what you're, you know, you're not, it's not a rocket ship in terms of bandwidth. Um, generally, what you're doing when you're doing data transfer between devices is NFC is used um, to bootstrap some other kind of protocol, typically like either Bluetooth or Wi-Fi direct, and then do the data transfer over that. We'll talk a little bit about that. The uh, NFC Forum is who maintains the NFC standards. Um, NFC Forum is, is formed in 2004. It's a, uh, a consortium, I guess you could say, of um, Nokia, Sony, Samsung. Those were the founding members um, of the family. Uh, and now has over about 150 member companies. So basically, they're who lays down the, the um, standards specific to NFC. Um, although, as we'll see, there's a bunch of other standards that NFC is built on, like ISO 14443 uh, and some others. Uh, but the actual uh, 18092, I believe it is, uh, standards are all laid down by, um, by NFC form. Um, okay, so some of the uses for NFC. Um, one of the big ones uh, that you hear a lot about now are contactless payment systems. Uh, some of the players in that space are Google Wallet. 
Um, I will do Google, obviously, and ISIS. ISIS is a comp competitor of theirs. Uh, this was rolled out, or is in the process of being rolled out by uh, Verizon, AT&T, uh, I believe Bank of America, um, uh, who's the other one that was involved, one of the other banks? Uh, Capital One actually just bailed on them. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, but if you can think of one of the reasons that mobile payments are not more prevalent, uh, first of all, mobile payments, if you're not familiar with them, like I said, is your device acts as a, an NFC card or RFID, RFID card. And you hold your device up to a payment kiosk, or a reader rather, and uh, your bank account or credit card account is accessed through the reader and verifies your payment. Um, one of the reasons that you do not see that, that it hasn't made more progress in the U.S. is the fact that you have these two competitors. And you have a scenario where Verizon uh, is actually, and uh, AT&T were blocking um, Google Wallet, uh, Google from allowing, uh, from getting the Wallet app onto their phones. Uh, they were also blocking, or denying, Verizon was, uh, denying Google access to the secure element in their devices, which is a, a secure integrated circuit. Um, it, it, it's almost a computer within a computer. Uh, it has a processor, an operating system, and RAM, and that is that's secure. You, you need cryptographic keys to access it. Uh, a lot of uh, Android phones now have an embedded version of these. We'll talk more about these later. Um, but anyway, this is where the important stuff would be stored. Your, your credit card or uh, numbers or your bank account numbers or what have you, things you don't want people to get a hold of. Uh, would be stored in there. So to really do secure mobile payments, you want to use one of those. Well, Verizon said, oh, we can't just allow you access to this and security involved here. You know, yeah, uh, what? No, no, we're not, we're more, our own payment system? Well, that has nothing to do with that. You're being silly. Um, at any rate, so that sort of um, fracas between the, the players in this space is why it hasn't gotten, is one of the main reasons it hasn't gotten further than it has so far. Um, it's basically, you know, no, they don't want it to get, uh, you know, widely uh, implemented before they get their piece of the pie, and, and, and a significant amount of money is at, at play here. Uh, Samsung's in the mix there too. There's a lot of companies, uh, you know, it, that are jockeying for position in there. We'll talk more about that a little later. Um, so anyway, uh, data transfer between devices. Uh, as I said, NFC is typically used to actually bootstrap another kind of protocol uh, because NFC is so low, you know, such a low transfer rate. Uh, typically, uh, Bluetooth, uh, which is Android Beam. Uh, I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. Um, but on the Samsung devices, uh, like my S4, they have what's known as the Samsung S Beam, and in that case. Uh, you're using NFC to bootstrap a Wi-Fi direct connection between the devices, which actually allows for a higher transfer rate than uh, Bluetooth. Um, read NFC tags. So pretty much just like regular RFID tags, um, uh, but generally you'll find them to be formatted to the NDEF format. Uh, which is the uh, NFC data exchange format. But you know, basically, you have a tag, uh, and you read the tag with your phone. Uh, this is used in, you know, in a variety of places, commonly used in what's known as smart posters. So you have a, a poster or some kind of sticker or whatever uh, you know, for an advertisement for a company. Um, you put your phone up against it, and it launches their web page, or it may launch their app uh, or download their app onto your phone or perform another function on your phone. Uh, there's a number of things. Uh, that can be performed on your phone um, by you by reading a uh, an NFC tag. Um, one of the things you can do, like I think, off the top of my head, is not like the burp in the microphone. Um, is uh, for instance, I've known some people that uh, when you walk into their house, they'll have an NFC tag. You read the NFC tag with your phone, and it will add their the SSID of their wireless network in their house to your phone, uh, along with the um, you know WPA pre-shared key or what have you, and everything else you need to be able to access their guest wireless network. So you can see you can perform fairly significant um, actions on your phone. Um, one of the other things, not besides NFC door locks, you see these getting quite uh, you, you see quite a few of these now. I don't know about their popularity, but um, there's uh, several different vendors that have them, and basically you can use an app on your phone to unlock your house uh, uh, by walking up to the, the device. Um, they're typically multi-protocol, meaning you'll see uh, ones that are um, NFC enabled, they'll also be enabled for say Z-Wave and Bluetooth and or Zigbee. Um, 
not cheap, like around three hundred dollars starting. Um, but you know, uh, pretty cool stuff. Um, definitely uh, fun stuff to hack on um, if you're into wireless hacking. Um, the other thing in that space that's even a little more interesting is um, it, it, NFC, uh, on the um, end of using your device as a as a NFC, as a tag um, or as a card is um, some vendors like HID are uh, rolling uh, or offering. Um, Systems like HIDS, CIOS, SCOS, where your device, your phone acts as a HIDI class um, vicinity card or building access card. So instead of using a card that you only use to gain access to your office, you hold your phone up to the reader and it verifies you. Uh, this once again uses the secure element in the card. In their case, it's an SD card based secure element, um, and is verified against the back end system. Um, so yeah, that's pretty cool. And hotels are doing this as well. Um, um, the um, Aria in Las Vegas has a card-based system right now, which is regular NFC contactless cards. Um, but what a lot of these hotels are looking to do in the future is you'd go to the hotel, you'd check in, you'd have an app on your phone from them, and it would provision your room keys right into your phone. Uh, ostensibly stored in a secure element, if it was to be done in a secure manner. But uh, regardless, provision to your device, and then you go up to your room, you uh, uh, open your uh, your room with your uh, with your phone. So that's uh, something else that's being uh, you know uh, tested at this point. I don't know any actual um, implementations of it, but uh, they are looking to do that. Uh, okay, so mobile devices, uh, as you can see here, uh, very prominently figured here are the uh, Android-based devices. Um, iPhone still does not have it, although it's been widely speculated that the iPhone 6 will have it, although there's been, as far as I know, no confirmation from Apple on that. Um, there was also some speculation the iPhone 5 would have it, but you know, at this point, I would imagine that they would not leave this out of the next version. Um, it's been in the Nexus since the Nexus S, um, so it's, uh, or uh, yeah, the Galaxy and Nexus series since the Nexus S. Um, the first phone to have it was actually a Nokia uh, phone. The Nokia device was the first phone to have NFC in it. Uh, but since then, you can see that the Nexus and the Galaxy Nexus series, uh, or Galaxy series, um, all have had NFC enabled in them. Um, mostly up until now, they were using NXP chipsets. Um, the uh, Nexus S had the NXP um, 544, I believe, in it, and the uh, Galaxy Nexus, which is probably one of the best phones for uh, NFC hacking, uh, had the uh, PN65 NXP chipset. Um, as of the S4, the Galaxy S4, um, they were actually use, also using NXP's uh, NFC stack in the phones. So NXP had a really good thing going. Uh, with Samsung, but for whatever reason, as of the S4 now, they are using a Broadcom NFC chipset, and the secure element in the devices is a, a secure element from Inside Secure, and they're also using Inside Secure's NFC stack now, too. So, uh, apparently, a bit of a falling out there. Um, as we'll see later, one of the advantages, at least having an NXP chipset, is some of the um, uh, tags, I guess you could say, and use like uh, NXP's MyFair Classic don't fully implement the standards, so if you don't have an NXP chipset, you can't read those cards. Uh, okay, so some of the standards involved. Uh, we have uh, ISO IEC 14443 A and B. Um, the, the main difference between type A and B is the modulation and bit encoding in use. Um, uh, we'll talk in a minute about what level of, uh, of uh, the radio of communication takes place at what parts of the standards. But um, JISX uh, 6319, that's the Japan Industrial Standard, that's Felica. Um, that's a Type 3 card, that's um, uh, Sony's uh, standard or Sony's product. Um, ISO IEC uh, 18092, um, that that's also known as NFC IP-1, which focuses specifically on peer-to-peer -peer communication between two mobile devices. So that defines that, uh, 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 that, that part of the standard. Um, and then we have uh, ISO IEC 15693, uh, which is the standard for vicinity cards. It's not really NFC, uh, but it is. It's, no, it's known as NFC vicinity. Um, and it is, it's mainly for access control cards for, uh, for building access. Um, it's, 
we've got full support in Android. Um, so it's one of the, as we'll see, one of the, the um, standards in order to implement Android, uh, implement NFC in Android as per um, Google's standards for the Android open source project, you must support NFC B. Uh, but the, depending on what chipset you have in your phone, it may or may not work with different types of cards uh, that fall into that space. So. There's a lot of, as you can see, there's a lot of different standards involved, and some uh, vendors take all of them or not all of them, and sometimes there's not quite the interoperability that you would hope. So sometimes it's you know it's a little bit of a crapshoot as to whether you know this tag is going to work with your chipset and so on and so forth. Uh, anyway, a little bit more about uh, ISO fourteen four four three uh, dash one. Uh, specifies the physical characteristics. Dash two specifies the radio frequency, power, and signal. Uh, dash three specifies initialization and anti-collision. Uh, and then four would specify, would specify the transmission protocol. Now this is where some uh, vendors like uh, NXP with their MyFair Classic um, and also the MyFair Ultralight, I believe, um, divert from the standard. And in, in the case of the MyFair Classic, um, NXP uh, was utilizing their own uh, cryptographic uh, exchange called Crypto One. Uh, you know, in-house crypto always wicked secure, right? Uh, not so much. So that thing's been riddled full of holes in the past uh, five years now, um, and is you know pretty much it's 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 the NFC equivalent of WEP. It's you know don't <laughs> use it for the love of God. Okay, all right. So how does NFC work? So NFC falls into the um, uh, thirteen five four five six megahertz range, which is the uh, RFID high frequency band. Um, it is one of the RFID technologies that uses inductive coupling. What is inductive coupling? Well, inductive coupling is the reader generates a magnetic field, and then thereby powers the tag with that magnetic field uh, as a capacitor in it that's powered by the um, powered by the reader. Uh, and then uh, to send data back to the excuse me, send data back to the reader, uh, the tag modulates that field, uh, and thereby sends the data that the uh, reader is requesting. Uh, use amplitude shift keying for modulation by and large. Anyway, um, from uh, the uh, PCD to PIC, uh, the PCD is the payment uh, proximity coupling device. That's the reader. Uh, PIC is a proximity integrated. Uh, Integrated circuit uh, proximity integrated circuit card. God, I almost forgot something. Um, and that is a card. All right. So those are the two terminologies. Uh, but anyway, from reader to card, it uses a modified Miller encoding. It modulates at 100 percent. So like a one is 100 percent a signal, and a zero is like pretty much nada, uh, at least on top of the carrier wave. Um, a um, there's a, a, an edge case of that. A PCD transmitting at 106 kilobits will use modified Miller at 100 percent. Um, the um, pick to uh, the card to reader rather uses uh, Manchester encoding, not modified Miller, um, and it will modulate at 10%. Uh, the reason for that being that um, you know you you're obviously don't have a lot of power uh, when you're you know you're, the tag is being powered by the reader. Um, and so in order to be uh, somewhat conservative on that, you're only going so now a one is 100% of the signal, uh, and um, a zero would be 90% of the signal. So um, you can eavesdrop on this pretty easily and see this using oscilloscope and probes. Um, however, um, it's a lot easier to read from reader to tag than it is to read from tag to reader because of the way that the, uh, the, the wave uh, form looks. All right, so three modes of operation. Um, reader writer, again, the device, uh, your mobile device will act as a reader and read a card. All right. Uh, peer to peer, you have two devices uh, in, in a, in a uh, will exchange data uh, in a scenario such as Android Beam or Samsung's S Beam. You put the devices back to back, and they are used. Uh, NFC is used to bootstrap and other protocols such as Bluetooth or Wi-Fi Direct. Um, there's a couple different uh, frames that are used there. You have a polling request and polling response frame. Basically, when the uh, connection first takes place, uh, the reading device will, will make a polling request, and the other, uh, the the device being read, will make a polling response. Uh, and then after that, a transport frame is used. Um, the frames pretty much the frame layout is all pretty much the same, though. Uh, I believe it all it usually will begin with a header of uh, 48 bits of Manchester encoded zeros. 
Um, there's two modes there, active and passive. Uh, active is both devices will actually take turns um, uh, acting as the, uh, the reader, if you will. Um, where, and passive is the, uh, where the, they'll both generate the signal, take turns generating a signal. Uh, passive is one device generates the signal and the other device uh, modulates, all right, a acting as if it was a tag, more or less. Um, and then we have card emulation mode, which I said the mobile device behaves as a card itself. Um, this can be done one of two ways. It can either be done with a secure element, um, where the secure element itself acts as the card, and it's pretty much just a pass-through, right through the contactless front end, which is the, uh, the NFC chip, straight to the secure element, and it will interact with the card reader directly. Um, or you can use uh, what's known as host card emulation or software card emulation. Um, <clears throat> this would be done if you don't have access to the secure element or don't have one. And in this case, your, your application processor will talk directly to the reader. And basically, you'll be doing this in software. You'll be software uh, card emulation through an app, right? Um, so not nearly, obviously, secure because you don't have anywhere safe, quote-unquote, to put your keys. Um, but if you don't have control over your secure element, like pretty much all of you won't have because, uh, as we'll see, the carriers pretty much control most of the ways that you can use a secure element. Uh, it's, it's a good way to be able to, be, be able to get around that. All right. Oop. What am I doing here? Okay. Um, so, uh, a little bit about, you know, how the NFC transfers data. Um, one of the ways it does this, or one of the main way it does this, is NDEF, uh, which is the NFC data exchange format. And what you have here is you have an NDEF message. Uh, it, it's basically, it's not such a protocol as it is a standard of encapsulating data. So you have your NDEF message. In that, you will have one or more NDEF records. And those can be one of uh, several different types. It could be a URI, uh, text, different MIME types, or handover parameters for another kind of connection, such as you know, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi Direct. Um, and then inside the end the of record, you're going to have the end of payload, and that is your actual payload. That's your actual data, right? All right. So the layout here, more or less, I don't think my little beam is going to work. Yeah, let me see that. Okay. So here we have our end message, in that we have one or more end records. By the way, you can have as many end records as you want, pretty much. There's no top end on that. Uh, inside each of these end records, you have a header and a payload. And then you have the type name format. Uh, which denotes what type of data it is, um, and then the uh, or what type of record rather, and then you have the ID, which is optional to use, and then the payload length. Um, this header here in the first NDEF record and header, pay attention to that when we talk about Android, because that's what Android uses to figure out what kind of app to launch on your phone. It reads the first one and figures out from that. Excuse me. <coughs> uh, more or less what you know app you should we should be using for this we'll talk about that in a second okay uh, so just real quick though um, some of, of the uh, record types um, you, you can see you have quite a few it can be a smart poster it can be text URI or different handover requests um, and then we have the URI identifier codes here so if your record type is URI it's not just HTTP or HTTPS as we typically think of a URI or URL as um, <clears throat> excuse me, it could be mail to, uh, it could be FTP or FTPS, SMB, NFS, uh, Telnet, uh, real-time streaming protocol, it could be SIP, it could be TFTP, or if you look down the end here, it's kind of neat, this is all different kind of Bluetooth stuff, right? So you have Bluetooth L2 cap, um, or you have uh, TCP OBEX, uh, exchange protocol, so, or just uh, denote a file location. So you, you have a lot of different types of URIs that you can open, uh, that you can, you can request the, the phone to, uh, to visit. Um, so, all right, NFC on Android. I figured I'd talk a little bit about NFC on Android because it is probably the most significant most implementation and has the most support, by the way, if you want to find out a lot about N uh, NFC. The uh, Android Developer's Guide is really, really good. Um, it's really very detailed, and I am not a you know an Android developer, um, but I can you know very much understand everything that's 
uh, you know, it's very intuitive in the way that the code is laid out and such. So, uh, and they're very descriptive. So anyway, mandatory on Android NFC devices. So if you're going to implement uh, NFC on Android, you have to support NFC A, B, um, which is type A and B, F, which is Felica, um, Sony's uh, standard or product, NFC V, which is the uh, NFC vicinity, or uh, vicinity cards. Now, you may have support on it in Android, um, but you, again, whether your chipset will read the, the particular type of card is up in the air. Um, <clears throat> there's also support for it in, uh, on Nokia phones, uh, for a certainty. I'm not sure about others, but I do know Nokia has a guide uh, related to it as well. I don't know if it is as fully implemented as it is on Android. Um, and anyway, so optional is um, uh, NXP's MyFair cards. Uh, some are w of which are more NFC compliant than others. For instance, the um, MyFair Classic cards, uh, as I said, if you do not have an NXP chipset, you're not going to be able to read them because of the fact that they use Crypto One, uh, which is a proprietary NFC, um, NXP technology, rather than any kind of standards-based um, cryptography. Um, all right, so NFC and Android. So I was just saying about the records is, so we read a tag with an Android device. It creates a tag object, okay? And then it passes this to an, act, an Android activity encapsulated in an intent. So basically what it does is it reads the first re record uh, in the NDF message and the header. And then based on that, it tries to figure out the best activity to handle it. So basically what it'll do is, first off, if you have an application in the foreground, something open on your phone, and it's registered to handle NDEF data, it's going to go to that one first. He's going to win. If there isn't, then it's going to look for um, applications that in their Android manifest.xml file have registered themselves as being able to handle NDEF data. So it's going to go with those guys first, one of those guys, most best fit. Um, if failing that, it's going to fall back. And the, uh, the, the function it calls is action NDEF uh, discovered. Um, if that fails, it's going to go to action uh, tech discovered, where it will see, okay, is anybody registered to handle NFC A, NFC B, F, V, you know, based on what this uh, technology in use is. Failing that, it's going to fold back on action tag discovered. Now, action tag discovered is, is pretty general, so it's going to go by the type of tag. They recommend that you don't register your app under that sort of uh, you know, for, for, the, uh, for tag technology because you'll likely lose if any other app is, uh, is registered to handle this. So now failing that, if, if nothing happens, it's gonna, it'll open up the activity selector and then you get that thing where it'll say, hey, what do you want to use to open this? It could be this, 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 or that, right? Um, as of 4.0, Android uh, introduced one of the AAR's app, uh, Android application records. So you can embed the package name of your app in the NDEF record, and then uh, Android will launch that app um, when the tags stand. Failing that, if it doesn't have the app on there, it will open the Google Play Store and prompt you to download it. Um, some of the tag types, there's four types of tags, type one through four. Um, basically the big difference between them is memory capacity, as you can see, and also whether they're like read and rewrite capable, and whether you can configure them as read only, or they're configured by the manufacturer as being like read only or read and rewrite. So you can see type one and two, user can configure as read only, while type three and four uh, are configured by the manufacturer uh, to be in one of those states. So if we look at some of the tag types here, um, all the tag types were based on an existing technology, an existing product. So type one was based on Innovations Topaz tags. Type two based on NXP's MyFair Ultralights. Uh, the Ultralights are very cheap cards used to generally for ticketing, uh, like paper tickets, like concert tickets, like stuff you throw out, that's how cheap they are. Um, I don't want to, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about ultralights and their security uh, in a little bit. Um, type 2 is NXP's uh, NTAG 203, which is not a very popular tag. Type 3 is Felica, again. Um, then type 4 is NXP's Desfire tags, Desfire EV1s. Um, and then we have uh, also the Smart MX. Uh, interesting thing though, the Smart MX is actually what's utilized for um, secure elements in a lot of Android phones. And it is a 
totally, I guess you could say it's a computer within a computer. It has a processor, it has memory, uh, it has its own operating system, which is the uh, Java card operating system, uh, and its own series of standards in order to be able to actually access it or manage applets on it. Um, so it, it's a fairly sophisticated device. Um, then we have the NXP specific stuff, like I said, My Fair Classic, where they implemented up until ISO 14443 3, but on that fourth layer on top, they're using Crypto One. So those are not totally standards compliant. Um, so NFC fee, like I said, the uh, tags are defined as ISO 15693. Uh, communicates over 13.56 megahertz, same frequency as NFC, but it's not really you know NFC per se, right? Um, it is uh, you know one of the more significant things you can say deployments of it or what you're seeing in HID what they're doing with CIOS right now uh, where your phone is acting as an i-class card so that's a perfect example of NFCV um, in Android it's android.nfc.tech.nfcv as code support um, some of the tags are NXP's iCode uh, tags uh, and HID's i-class uh, I believe with the NXP iCode you may have an issue there reading those if you don't have an NXP chipset. I'm not entirely sure, but I do believe that. Um, there's also uh, Texas Instruments tag it, tags fall under that. Um, and then SD Micro, their Lyric family of cards also fall under what you don't call NFC vicinity. Um, so, okay, so peer-to-peer -peer mode. You are putting two devices together transferring data. Uh, it's more or less how the stack works out. Um, ISO 18092 defines uh, the bottom layer, okay? You could think of this more as the physical layer, if you will. Um, the logical link control protocol, you could think of this as like the data link protocol or the MAC layer, okay? It is a data link protocol. Uh, and then on top of that, you're either gonna have the simple NDEF exchange protocol, which is a standards-based protocol, or on some Android devices, not the newest, but I believe ICS and below, um, you will have uh, what's known as the NDEF push protocol, which is an Android-specific protocol. Um, it's a lot more simple and lightweight, and not, but doesn't have the features that uh, Snap has. Uh, as of uh, Jelly Bean, or, or I think I, I, sorry, ICS, and going forward, um, they also went to they they caved uh, Android caved in and went with Snap as well. So LLCP, um, it's a lot, layer two protocol. Um, and then uh, N uh, NF push protocol or SNAP will, will ride on top of it for the actual data exchange. And what those will exchange is the uh, NF um, messages. Um, it has two service types, which is either connectionless or connection oriented. So connectionless will be used if um, the higher layer, layer protocol in use um, does its own um, uh, reliable delivery, right? In which case, you don't need to do reliable delivery at two la layers, right? So in, in that case, you don't need to use, use that. But if the upper layer protocol does not do its own uh, reliable delivery, uh, L LLCP offers that, that functionality. Uh, and it does it by a, um, a, uh, a, a sliding window, uh, much like you have with TCP. Um, so, uh, it, 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 the, um, uh, the, the payload data units, PDUs, uh, um, that are in use, uh, the frames, if you will, are very simple. They're really only five fields. And it, what you'll see with like NPP and SNAP, it's the same thing. It's, there are only like four or five fields. And that's just um, the destination service uh, access point, which is, I guess you could say, like a port, right? Um, basically, what LCP does is opens up a socket. Uh, and listens. So you have in the field, you have a destination service access point, which is the address where it's going to. You have the PEU type, which is what kind of message this is, right? Um, is it a, a sync message? Is it a disconnect message? Is it a um, service discovery message at, you know, asking the destination device what kind of uh, uh, um, uh, services it, it, it offers? Um, and then you have the source service access point, which is the source address. Uh, then the sequence number, which is used for reliable delivery. And then the actual information that's being sent. Um, and then other protocols will ride on top of it, not just SNAP or NBP, but you could ride like um, the object exchange protocol on top of it, which you see used with uh, Bluetooth commonly, or IP. Um, so 
And the two protocols that can ride on top of it, you have NPP, which is the NF push protocol. It's an Android-based uh, protocol, not standards-based. Uh, it's used up until uh, Android 3.2. Um, and pretty much, it, it's very simple. Basically, um, in order to uh, conform to their standard, uh, you have to run a server. Each device that runs it has to run a server. And basically, the client connects to the server. It connects, it sends the NPP header, uh, which basically has like the version number and then what kind of data to follow uh, and then sends the, the NVP header and the NDEF entries and then disconnects. That's it. It's just a push. It's like a unidirectional protocol, a one-way push. Um, Snap is a little different. It's more of a bidirectional protocol uh, and it transfers via get and put messages. Um, it also supports fragmentation. So you can fragment larger uh, data units with it. Um, and it uses the LLCP, uh, Logical Link Control Protocol, the, the Layer 2 Protocol. It uses its connection oriented transport to do reliable delivery, so it doesn't do its own. So in this case, LLCP would use reliable delivery. Um, by the default, LICS on higher. And again, you see really it's like a five field um, frame. The frames are pretty much the same um, in the request and the response frames. You have the version, so that knows it's compatible with what it's talking to. Uh, then you have what, either a request or a response, it denotes which it is, uh, then the length, and then the actual information. So you can see like it's not a very high bandwidth, high throughput protocol. So all the stuff that's designed around these protocols is try to be as lightweight as possible. So there's not a lot of fluff. Uh, okay, so a little bit about hardware now. Um, so picking a good reader and writer, right? You want to... Um, you know, you, you want to have a few things. So LibNFC, that we'll talk about in a minute, um, you want to be compatible with Lib, LibNFC. LibNFC is what more, it's a library uh, for NFC, uh, hacking NFC, if you will, um, and most of the uh, tools that you would want to use uh, are based on it. So you want to be compatible with that. You want, your, you want your reader, writer to work with that. You want to be able to do card emulation um, so that you can em use your, uh, your NFC adapter to emulate a, a, a tag. Uh, you want to be able to do peer-to-peer -peer so you can communicate with other devices. Uh, and you want to pretty much support all the major standards, right? So you want to be able to communicate with any of the, any targets, devices, when you're a reader um, that conform to the major standards. Um, also, you want to be able to abort commands uh, and do things like cancel polling, and that's specific to peer-to-peer. -to -peer. And um, one of the issues with... Um, one of the readers, the ACR122U, uh, which was a very popular reader. Uh, it was, uh, some of its forms were the touch a tag reader or the tick tag reader. Um, it's, it's a great reader. However, there's been some issues with it working with NFC when, uh, LibNFC, when um, doing peer to peer, where basically, um, since it uses um, more, it, I, I shouldn't say LibNFC, because it really works with PCSC, uh, which is the Personal Computer Smart Card Library. Um, it's just like an abstraction layer. And it, it, the PCSC really doesn't have the ability to cancel polling or abort commands when doing peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, and because of that, you, a lot of people get a, a fairly frustrating experience when trying to do that sort of testing with that card. Um, I actually did include that card in the presentation though because it's a, still a very popular card and um, as I'll talk about, Charlie Miller um, did some very good work with it, uh, fuzzing uh, NFC devices uh, for some research he did uh, at Black Hat two years ago. So I figure it's good enough for Charlie, it's good enough for me. Um, but on the uh, fctools.org, which is the LibNFC site, there's a really good device compatibility page that lists a bunch of really good readers. So anyway, I know I'm getting a little behind here, so I'm going to try to speed it up a bit. Um, this one is the PN532 breakout board. Uh, it's available at Adafruit. Uh, great board, pretty cheap. It's like $40. Um, very compatible with all the major standards and does card emulation mode. And the cool thing about it is that it's very expandable. It's a really good chipset. Um, and the, uh, it's really good if you have a Raspberry Pi. Uh, you can basically hook this right up to the Pi and now you have a, a perfect self-contained unit for doing NFC hacking. Um, so if you have a Raspberry Pi, I would seriously consider this board. Uh, and you can get it from Adafruit. Uh, and there's also uh, some tutorials there about implementing it, what you can do with it, et cetera, and so forth. Um, but this is a very good chipset, uh, one, one of the most popular. Um, this is the reader I actually have, which is the uh, SCM uh, CL3711. It's an identity uh, reader. Um, 
I've found a couple things. I'm going to, it seems to be a very fast reader and very reliable. Um, it also has full libfc support and was the most recommended adapter to use um, with libfc from the uh, fellow that wrote and maintains libfc. So that's a fairly ringing endorsement. Um, uh, the other one thing about this card that I found though is that if you are going to utilize it on, uh, say, like Kali Linux or Backtrack, so I use it on Kali. Um, you guys familiar with Kali? Fantastic distro. Um, so anyway, Kali has a lot of um, uh, NFC uh, hacking tools built into it, which makes it a pretty useful distro for that, in my opinion. Um, but one thing about it is that it will load, when you plug this device in, there's two things you want to do. You want to do an LS mod and then grab for PM533. And if you find that module loaded, uh, do an RM mod, PM533, to remove it. Otherwise, it won't find the reader. Uh, the other thing you want to do is a kill all PCSCD to kill the PCSC demon. Uh, so, because libfc and PCSC will fight each other. So, if they're both loaded, you want to make sure one goes away. It's like Highlander, there can be only one. Um, <laughs> hey, Highlander reference. Gladly. Doors. So, anyway. Yeah, uh, very good reader. I, I, I'm, I'm a fan of this one. And again, it's only like $40. <laughs> so this one, this one's like the unicorn. Um, these guys, uh, Milo Miloš, I can never remember this guy's last name, uh, but he's forgotten more about RFID than probably most people, including myself, will ever know. Um, does some really awesome workshops on it, uh, and has released a bunch of really great devices. This is a purpose-built device for RFID hacking, uh, specifically um, 13.56 uh, NFC hacking. Um, the only downside is that their web store, which was supposed to reopen in August, uh, did not reopen in August. Uh, I'm going to try to actually get in touch with these guys and find out why, because I really wanted one, because it's like a really, really cool device. A um, little more expensive at 60 bucks. The, um, the, the schematics actually are available on their site to build it. So if you are pretty good with, uh, with hardware hacking, a little bit better than I am, uh, you may want to give that a whack. Although I've considered it myself, and uh, I uh, would foresee some more soldering iron burns in my future. Um, but yeah, uh, if you can get your hands on one of these, I highly recommend it. Um, and then, like I already said, the ACR 22 u um, great guy, great car, uh, I mean, very popular device. Uh, the only place you might run into some problems is with, like, with doing certain peer-to-peer -peer testing. Um, supposedly the ACR 122 USB driver um, corrects this somewhat, but they still, I, I thought it was kind of fixed, and then um, I read a, uh, a post on the uh, LibNFC forum from the fellow that, that wrote it and maintained it. And uh, he you know, basically concluded with, this is why I don't recommend this card to be used. And this was you know, only a couple months ago, so I guess it's still an issue. Um, but at any rate, yeah, like I said, Charlie used this um, card when he did his NFC, uh, his um, Don't Stand So Close to Me, an analysis of the NFC attack surface talk at Black Hat. So, yeah, good enough for Charlie, good enough for me. Um, and then also the Proxmark 3. Proxmark 3, purpose-built RFID hacking device, supports not only high frequency, but also low frequency. Um, you have to have an antenna for each, so you have to buy each antenna separately. Um, but uh, designed by Jonathan Westhues, um, and really cool, I mean, you can sniff NFC with this. You can sniff um, uh, read, you know, card to read or reader to card traffic, uh, or read the cards with it. Um, and some of the attacks against things like MyFair, one of the attacks was based on you uh, being able to intercept traffic, so you can utilize that. A um, little pricey, um, but certainly worth having. And I believe there are, again, um, schematics available to build it yourself, if you are uh, uh, ambitious. Um, and this one's, hmm? That doesn't look like a DIY kind of card. No, no, I wonder, as I understand it, it is not any kind of easy. Um, <laughs> but I do believe this stuff is available. Uh, I don't know what is involved, but uh, yeah, not, uh, yeah, yeah, not something I'd attempt anyway. Um, but, but, but most of our guys use it for, um, yeah, our guys that do a lot of physical pen testing. Um, I don't do a lot of physical pen testing myself. Apparently people say I look suspicious. Uh, <laughs> Imagine that! Yeah. Um, so, um, but they use it for, it's basically for um, cloning stuff like HIV's box cards. So basically, 
the uh, that's low frequency stuff, so it doesn't really fall into the NFC range. But um, the low frequency antenna looks sort of like a black CD. And what you do is you take this guy, stuff him in your pocket, run the wire down your sleeve, and pop the antenna. You go to the Starbucks nearest your target organization uh, on Monday morning, and you wait for a couple of their employees to come in. Usually Starbucks is pretty crowded. So you're looking for the guy that hangs his badge on his, on his belt. And you just get up close enough to him in line to just kind of give him a little bump. It's actually better to uh, give him a little bump than just to kind of mosey up so close to somebody, because that sets off people's alarms. Anyway, so you by able to do that, you're able to clone the tag. You take the tag and it stores it in the re, in the uh, box mark. And then you can walk up to the reader and replay it back into the reader. This will get you into the building. Now, um, Brad, who spoke to me here last year, wrote a firmware upgrade for it, or a patch called Proxbrew. And what this does is they found that um, in the prox in the uh, box cards, um, there's like uh, the the memory layout goes like. Um, Country ID, and then facility ID, and then user ID. And the user ID, or the employee ID, is not very long. I can't remember the length, but it's, it's brute forceable. Um, it's within a reasonable brute force range. Um, so what you can do is, uh, you, you say you're the employee you've, you, that you've copied their badge. They have access to the building, but they don't have access to the executive floor, and they don't have access to the server room. So you take that, you get in the building, and then you go to the uh, reader for the server room. And you put the antenna up to it, and it will cycle through that key space and try each avail e e e uh, e each option until it finds the correct key. Now, the only downside to this is it could take a little while. And number two, a lot of readers, when you get an incorrect read, will beep, so it can get noisy. Oddly enough, only one of our guys has gotten popped doing this. Um, one of them actually got so bored of holding it there that he actually took the wire for the antenna and thumbtacked it to the wall over the reader and just sat down in a chair with the antenna hanging over the reader. Um, somebody apparently came by and asked him what he was doing. He said he was calibrating the reader. It's noisy, isn't it? So, anyway. <laughs> yeah. They'd say something, right? You'd say. So the, the guy that got busted, this, that is what happened. But what happened was, it wasn't quite that. It was they had an employee um, that had left the uh, organization uh, under bad terms, uh, very bad terms. And um, they had his uh, uh, ID marked in the system. If this guy comes in, all hands on deck, right? So. The one they 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 so went, hit that one they first. hit that one yeah. and they came a running boy. Yeah, he's like, dude, he's like, there was four of them on me before I knew it happened. You know? Yeah. So. Good, t good test. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Bad luck for him. That's a good security feature, though. Yeah. Yeah. Like a random number. Yep. Yeah, he had the wrong number. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what's he? Uh, uh, all right, so a um, little bit more about hardware. Um, so chipsets, the PN65 and is what's in like the Galaxy Nexus, is one of the phones I have. Um, it is a, um, it, it combines an NFC radio, which is the PN512, which is actually the NFC crit radio, the contactless front end, uh, an ADC51 microcontroller, which runs, runs it, right? Um, and then uh, it has a uh, built-in SmartMax chip uh, for the secure element uh, and can com communicate to the SIM card over a single wire. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute because there's three form factors for secure elements. There's embedded, where it's either an embedded chip in the device or built into or in combined uh, combination with the NFC chip. Or it can be in the uh, UICC, which is the SIM card, um, or it can be in the SD card. So that's three ways of doing it. And the way to talk to the SD card or the SIM card, the practical way anyway, is using single wire. Um, the way to talk to an embedded secure element is to use S2C, which is also known as NFC wired, uh, NFC WI. Anyway, all right. So, um, to give you a little bit of the layout of how the chip works here. So the um, the PN five. 44, uh, let's start from here. Okay, so here's the, uh, the contactless for the front end. This is the, actually the NFC chip here with the contactless front end, all right? Hanging off the side here, you see the SmartMX chip, which is the uh, secure element, right? Uh, and then you have the hardware access layer. You have the microcontroller here, 
And then all this right here um, is known as uh, the PN 531, I believe. Um, one layer out, um, all this right here minus the embedded secure element is the PN 544. And that's the chipset that was like in the Nexus S um, and whatnot. So the only difference between the PN5, uh, 65N and the PN544 is that the 65N has an embedded, has a built in, I should say, built in uh, secure element. What you have here with a, a single wire uh, is uh, the ability to talk to a uh, SIM card. It's a universal integrated circuit card, which is a, a SIM card. So if you have a secure element built into the form factor of a SIM card, you can talk over single wire with that. The HCI here, the host controller interface, that's the interface back to the application processor. So that's the way back to the application processor. There's actually a standards-based version of that now called NCI that the uh, NFC uh, standards organization came up with. So they standardized it. Um, remember the NCI thing. I'll come back and play in a minute. So anyway, that's pretty much how they're laid out. Um, so anyway, secure element, like I said, it's a tamper-resistant secure microcontroller, okay? Um, it will actually, some of them, if you uh, try to access them with the incorrect key too many times, it will just stop letting you in even if you have the right key. Um, so the keys, you, you're not going to be able to, hmm? I'm sorry. Um, you're not going to be able to utilize it without your own keys. And the keys are generally controlled by what's known as uh, trusted service managers. Um, they are an intermediary, a middleman, a play, a, 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 I'm not sure what they really do, but they make a lot of money. Intermediary between the banks, the carriers, the manufacturers, and everybody that's involved in mobile payments. And they control the keys to the actual devices. So basically, if um, a bank, you know, big bank A wants to um, implement an app that would utilize the, um, the secure element to store its keys or bank numbers, they would intermediate between them and the manufacturer and the, the uh, mobile carriers, right? right? So suffice it to say, you don't have the keys to your secure element, all right? The two secure elements that are controlled by the carriers are the embedded one and the one in the SIM card. Um, the, the SD cards are not controlled by the carriers, obviously, but less and less phones seem to be coming out uh, having SD cards. So anyway, um, communicating with the embedded secure element, it's done over STC, uh, STC which is NFC wired, and there's three modes of communication there. There's off, uh, just off. Uh, wired, where um, apps on your phone can communicate directly to the secure element. Um, so basically, if you have an app that wants to store its, store its keys securely and such, um, it can do that, and then virtual. In virtual, it does pass through to the contactless front end, and the um, secure element talks directly to the card reader. The reason this this is, like you can say, one way is these elements can actually emulate cards completely. So, like NXP SmartMX can totally be a MyFair 1K, a MyFair 4K, and I believe some other cards as well. So it can completely has modes where it can completely emulate a card and just be 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 the card, be the card. No, 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 no. Yeah. Can you shock anyone? No. Right. Okay. So, a um, couple more things about the other ones. So, UICC. Um, to communicate with the SIM card, the problem with the SIM card is the SIM card is not connected directly to the application processor. It's connected to the baseband processor, which is a totally different deal. Um, you, can, you have to go to the radio interface layer, which has uses AT commands. It's like a proprietary IPC interface. Um, there's access, the, the um, Seek for Android toolkit actually um, provides a smart card API that lets you get access to it. However, some of the libraries that are in use to be able to get to it in the code on the phones are proprietary, and so if they don't add, add the code to them, which they haven't, you can't utilize it, right? So the other way of doing it is you can use single wire, single wire protocol, if the NFC controller supports it to get it, gain access to it. Same way you can get access to the SD card. Quick question, how much time do I have? Up on an hour here in five minutes. Okay, so I just want to rock it, or just want to rock through here real fast. So as I already said, the difference between the PN65N and the PN544 um, is that the uh, PN65N has a built-in uh, SmartMX chip. Um, the secure elements, the, the, the SmartMX chip, uh, particularly anyway, uses as its own operating system as a Java card OS. Um, and then the actual interface and standard to um, install, remove, change, delete applets, which is what they're called, um, on the um, uh, on the secure element um, is uh, governed by what's known as the Global Platform Card Manager. 
And Global Platform was a standard that was developed by Visa and now is its own independent entity. But they control or, or the, the standard, I guess you could say, they, they dictate the standard as to how you can do that because each individual applet inside that secure element is its own entity, right? It, it, they have to be separate, right? Because in theory, at least, you'd have one from Bank of America, you might have one from Google, Google, one from Chase, right? And they can't, they are never the twain shall meet. That's not what's happening right now because the carriers are so jealously guarding these things. But that's what should happen. Okay, uh, okay so LibFC, I already talked about. Open source C library, brand C, most of the stuff, um, most of the tools that you'll encounter will be written uh, using this library. Um, one of the cool things about it, though, too, is that it also has a lot of really great uh, utilities. So if, like on Kali Linux, you just type NFC dash and hit tab a couple times, you'll come up with all these utilities for emulating cards, reading different types of cards, writing cards, right, what have you. So really cool stuff there. Um, definitely something you're going to want to have. Uh, RF Idiot was written by Adam Laurie. It's the same thing. It's a set of Python uh, scripts for interacting with um, RFID cards, not just NF NFC, but other cards as well. Um, it works with LibNFC and PCSC and will allow you to select which one you're using. Um, so I would highly recommend that. You can find that on Kali by typing read and then hitting tab a couple times. And it will show you, it's like read my fair simple, read my fair ultra. Um, some of them are a little flaky, but by and large, they work pretty well. Okay, so some prior work on attacks real quick. Charlie Miller, um, found a bunch of exploits, a bunch of vulnerabilities rather, in NFC um, and presented them at Black Hat a couple years ago. He also found a way to deliver, deliver exploits over NFC to a device and compromise it. Uh, MWR Labs did the same. Um, they actually used two exploits, one to compromise the device and another to get, uh, one to gain initial access to the device and the other to, for uh, privilege escalation. Colin Mulliner has done all kinds of different stuff. I would just take a look at his site. Dan Rosenberg found a bunch of buffer overflows in the Linux NFC stack. What he found it in was the NCI portion of it. Remember I told you of the HCI, those configuration interfaces, but it's standard based? At the time, it really wasn't used. So thankfully, at the time, it really wasn't used because these were real nasty buffer overflows. Um, so my fair, shot full of holes. Um, the dark side attack is the most prominent among them, but there were many others as well. A um, couple things, Corey Benninger and Max Sobel from um, Intrepidus um, did a talk a couple years ago on uh, cloning MIFR ultralight cards. Uh, and then um, Bug Guardian Eagle this year at DEF CON um, followed up on that by finding that you could lock the one-time um, the one-time pad in ultralight cards. So what's up with, uh, where is that? Did I miss it? Okay, let me talk about that real fast. Okay, so, oh no, I'm gonna talk about that a little, uh, in, the, in the MyFair section, which you've got to hurry to. So sniffing, MyFair, by, uh, NFC by itself doesn't uh, provide encryption, so you can sniff it. Uh, one way of the ways of doing this is the Proxmark 3, a uh, good way to do that. Wireshark has a whole bunch of dissectors in it for dissecting different kinds of NFC stuff. All right, another way of attacking, you're rewriting tags. So if your tags, like you're using in smart posters and other stuff in public for advertisement, are not locked, right, I can walk up to it with my phone, rewrite them, send you to my evil site, and then when you go up and you, you put your phone against it, it's going to send you directly to my evil site. Um, on older voice, for, uh, on not even that much older versions of Android, it doesn't prompt you at all. On my uh, at Galaxy Nexus, it'll take me right to it. On my S4, it prompts me, but it, it also gives you the thing, don't ever display this again, please. So if you click that, which most people would because they don't get bothered by error messages, it's never going to ask you again, right? And most people are going to click OK anyway, okay? Um, this is also used to erase trips from the ultralight ticket I'll talk about in a minute. Zero clicks uh, sharing, pretty much the same idea. Um, you can put two devices together and pop stuff open on someone's phone without prompting them. Uh, but obviously, you know, you have to be right up against them. So their phone would have to be unattended. Okay, ultralight. My for ultralight. Um, doesn't have anything in the way of real encryption or anything. Um, it's utilized by a number of transit systems and also for paper ticketing, like concerts and stuff, right? Because it's very cheap. Um, all it has really is this 32-bit one-time pad. So figure it like this, right? What Max and Corey found was that, so it, what would really happen is after each trip you take on the train, you'd load your card up, right? You'd load up money on it, you'd pay money, and now you have all these trips. Every time you take a trip, you should set that one-time pad one of those bits to one, and you can't set them back. 
denoting that you've taken a trip and now you can't, you know, you're, run, you're running out of trips. What they found is that most of these places, um, most of these uh, transit systems weren't using that. And so you could just make a, you know, load up your card, make a copy of it of the card, read it, store it, and then once you run out of stuff, re rewrite it, right? Um, then, um, the, you know, some of these transit systems started using that. And then what Boghari and Eagle Beagle disclosed at DEF CON this year is that they found this, these, these lock bytes on uh, ultralight cards that'll let you lock different parts of memory, right? Our NFC cards or RVD cards are really just a grid of memory blocks, okay? As you'll see in a second. And you can lock any of those on there. What they found is that, uh, hey, well, what if we use this functionality to lock the one, the one time pad? Mm -hmm. Yep, lock the one time pad, and now when the transit system tries to write to it, nope, no good. Perfect. Um, th that, in a way, is what they get for using such a cheap card. It's not made for that sort of thing. It was not made to be used for this, but it was used anyway, probably because it was cheap. Um, EMV, Electronic Visa, Visa, uh, MasterCard and Visa Standard. Um, you, this is really just a standard-based thing. Uh, you can read cards like this, um, cards that have an a RFID chipset in them. Um, you can read these cards. Um, if, if all you have to do is conform to the standard. There's a tool like Pwn Pass, uh, and there's a couple apps is available too. They'll read out the card number, your name, although sometimes it'll just say card holder, uh, and the expiration date of the card. It won't read out the CVV number on the back um, because that's dynamic when used with this stat with this um, this standard. Um, Pwn Pass is cool because you can use it with a reader, but you can also use it with if you get your hands on a Vivo Pay reader. I have one, but I lost the freaking power brick for it. It's so pissed. <laughs> um, but it's really cool. It was pretty cheap, and you can you use this on a laptop with the v Vivo Pay to it, and you can read cards. Makes for a great demo if you don't lose your power brick. All right. So real fast, my fair because I know I'm running out of time here. Um, so my fair again, developed by NXP. It uses um, well, some of these are more standards compliant than other guys. So let's run down the list real fast. My fair classic. Um, uses uh, the Crypto One algorithm. It was uh, shot full of all kinds of holes. Terrible. Proprietary crypto, always bad. Um, the Ultralight uses no crypto at all, but has those one-time pads. Ultralight C implemented um, triple des. Um, MyFair Plus is an AES-128 drop-in to replace uh, the MyFair Classic. Um, the DES Fire uses triple des. This was um, defeated by a side channel um, power analysis attack in 2011. So up until then, it was cool. Um, the Desfire EV1 uses AES-128, and then we have the SmartMX, which we already talked about. Um, so MindFair Classic. So really widely implemented by public transfer, transit systems, okay? This is one that they were you know, supposed to use. Um, so it's standards compliant up to ISO 14443, but that top layer, that fourth layer, ISO 14, where ISO 14443-4 would be, it uses Crypto-1. Uh, Crypto One has all kinds of problems. We'll talk about that in a second. So the way it's laid out is you have 16 bytes of memory. So okay, you have a bunch of blocks. Uh, you, the, the sectors you have uh, in a MyFair Classic 1K, you have 64 sectors. Each sector has four blocks in it, and each block is 16 bytes of memory. It can either be a data block, which has data you can use for an access control system, or a value block, uh, which you use like in like electronic wallet, wallet, wallet systems. Okay. The last block of each sector um, is uh, going to have two 248-bit keys and four access control bits. Um, and then each sector is encrypted with its own key. The very first block of the very first sector is the manufacturer's block, and that contains the UID. Um, and then you have these different protocol commands for the memory in there. And basically you can do things like read, uh, based on your access control, what you're allowed to do. You can read, write, decrement, increment, restore, or transfer um, between these blocks. And it's laid out like this. So we have um, sector here, zero, one, two, all the way up to 16. So there's 16 of them. If you notice, each fourth block in the sector, there's four blocks in a sector, has a key A and key B. They're 48-bit keys. And then you have four access control bits. It's actually three. Um, and then there's one unused bit, all right? Um, and then the very first block of the very first sector is the manufacturer block, which contains the U UID, which is a unique ID of the card, um, and um, some other information as well, all right? So these keys here um, 
Should, you know, in, in, in theory, you know, you don't want, you would be using unique keys for each uh, sector or you would not be using the default keys. There are a number of default keys out there, a whole big list, in fact, uh, that were implemented. Uh, and as we'll see, that's one way to attack the cards. Um, okay, so real quick how MyFair does its authentication. Um, the reader, so basically the whole idea behind it is that the, the reader and the tag both want to make sure that each other knows the key. They don't trust each other, right? So the reader makes a request. Um, to the tag. So says, I want, I want to read you. The tag generates a random nonce, it sends it to the reader. The reader generates its own nonce, and then it also encrypts the nonce that the tag sent it. it sends back that encrypted uh, nonce and its own. The tag decrypts the uh, reader's nonce, and now knows that the reader has the key. It encrypts the reader's nonce um, with its own key, with, with, with the, the key it has, and sends it back to the reader. The reader then decrypts that, and now he knows, okay, the tag has the key. So now they both know they each have the key. This is at a high level how Crypto One works. So flaws in Crypto One, I'm going to get too deep because, like I said, I'm running out of time. Um, there's really low entropy. The pseudorandom number, number generator only is only 16 bits, all right, so it, it flips really fast. Um, there's a timing attack on the tag reader nonce because it's created only between the time it takes for the reader to power up and the tag ask for a challenge. Um, there is big time leakage in the parity keystream, uh, or the uh, keystream leakage rather. Um, it returns known parity error messages encrypted, so you have a known plain text attack there. And then the parity bit and the first bit of the next plain text byte are encrypted with the same key. So again, known plain text attack. Um, then there's weaknesses in the cipher, like it only uses odd bits to generate the, the, key, uh, the keystream. So that, yeah, so this reduces the key. Oh, yeah. So this reduces the, uh, the key space even further. And then you can roll back the uh, linear feedback um, shift register as well. Also, not on the slide, but I'd also, there's a implementation weakness where a lot of organizations where they'll maybe use the first like few blocks, right? Like they'll use like the first, you know, 10 blocks, uh, uh, 10 sectors on here, okay? And they'll nicely encrypt that with their key, their own key. But they'll leave the rest of the ones unused ones encrypted with the, the default key. Well, there's an attack, an offline nested attack, uh, that one of the tools you can use to implement is called NFOC. And what it does is you have to know one key. One key of any one sector on the device. Using that, you can then get the keys for everything else on the uh, card. So they maybe nicely encrypt those first you know, 10 uh, sectors with their, own key, with their own key, but they leave the other ones at the default because they're lazy. And you get one of those, it, this thing will try the default keys. There's like seven or eight of them. Finds that, boom, you're golden, all right? And uh, this uses libnfc. If you buy a chance, they're, they're good, 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 good people, and they don't um, encrypt any of these sectors or secure any of the, any of the sectors with the default key. MF, uh, CUK, uh, which is the My Fair Classic Universal Toolkit, I don't know what you think, um, <laughs> implements its own as the dark side attack. It doesn't need to know any keys. It just takes a little while. Um, so basically you tell it what sector you want to focus on. It will focus on that sector until it gets the key, one of the keys. You want key A or key B. You know, tell it, okay, I want key B from sector one. Once it gets that one key, now I have one key. Now I go back to MFOC, and I get the, all of the other keys like that. And that's it, and that's why uh, proprietary crypto sucks. Um, this is also integrated in the Proxmark firmware. Um, you can take the Proxmark logs and use it in MFC UK, or you can do it directly in Proxmark firmware. Um, so I have made it to the end. I hope I didn't go too far over. Some recommended reading. Um, Blackberry's Developer Resource Center, really good. Um, the Android Developer Guides, really, really good. Um, definite recommend reading there. The NFC form specs you can read here, and they actually are fairly readable, um, although there's still possibly a cure for narcolepsy. Um, and then this blog, if you want to know about Secure Element and Software Card uh, Emulation, Host Card Emulation. He did a three-part blog series on this, um, and it's really, the guy knows his stuff big time. Great reading. Uh, and his other stuff on Android isn't bad at all, so highly recommended. Um, question Jonas's. So what do you know about the HTC One? Mm, not that much, honestly. Um, I'm pretty much, like I always had Samsung phones. Um, I have a Galaxy Nexus, and right now I have an S4. 
Um, my Nexus has a, uh, the Galaxy Nexus has a NXP PN65N chipset in it, uh, and an NXP uh, uh, NFC stack. My um, S4 has a Broadcom chipset in it, Broadcom NFC, NFC front end, and an Insight Secure, Secure Element, and uses Insight Secure's NFC stack. Um, so the difference between those two also is that like my uh, Galaxy Nexus will read my Fair Classic cards, but the uh, Galaxy S4 unfortunately won't read them. Uh, not only that, it seems to have to be a little flaky with a lot of um, a lot of, uh, of uh, NXP's cards. Um, even the Dez Flyer sometimes it has problems reading, um, which it really shouldn't. Um, but I found like um, like I have uh, a bunch of different cards. If you guys want to look at them too, I have a. Uh, like the wow. Samsung Tactiles, um, which are um, uh, um, My Fair Desfire EV1s. Um, it shouldn't really have too much issue reading them, but sometimes it does. So, at any rate, yeah, but I'm sorry. Not, what is your question about the HTC One? I uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I think it might have the PN544 in it, honestly. Uh, are we flying back? I think I had a couple listed out. But maybe only the Samsung ones. I apologize for something of a bit of a Samsung bias. Um, way back. Yeah, I think it was further back, right? No, 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 not the first ones, dear. Um, no, I listed the ad and the uh, <coughs> galaxies. I can find out for you though, easy enough. So if you want to know, it's, it should be really easy to look up. Um, if you just do a search for um, HTC One NFC chipset on Google, you'll find it. They're really they're they're. They're pretty much very uh, easy to figure out what you have. So, um, yeah, one of the one of the things that, that would be really cool to do some research on would be, and I'm planning to, is to look into um, how are these secure elements managed. You know, how are the keys being managed? How are the keys being how are the keys being transferred in order to get access to these things? Right? There's got to be some way the keys are being transferred and managed in order to gain access to the actual card itself. Right? You know, the smart MX and stuff. So it's like, you know, how is ISIS or, you know, Verizon and Google handling this? Google actually doesn't even use the freaking secure element anymore because of all the stuff that went down with Verizon. Um, first, Verizon wouldn't give them access to the secure element. So what Google did now is they actually use, they don't use the secure element anymore. They use, and they don't use your credit card number. They use this, like, phony baloney MasterCard number that they all, use, they all have, that, that, like, on every phone. Um, and then they transfer that to the reader. Uh, the reader finds it as valid, but then you have identifying information that contacts your account on the back end and verifies it's you, and then will then communicate with your actual uh, account details. But they did that so apparently so that they could just do it all in software using software card emulation and get around the fact that the carriers, you know, AT&T and Verizon are trying to lock them out of the phones, right? Um, but then the carriers actually went as far as to block the uh, installation of the Google Wallet app from their phones. Um, first, they wouldn't allow it on the phone. They wouldn't allow it to be downloaded from the Play Market. And then, you know, people obviously found a way around that by sideloading it on the phones. But then they actually changed the code so that if you sideload the app, it will say this app cannot be run. So you actually have to make modifications to the um, firmware running on the device. Um, in order to be able to um, to utilize a Google Wallet on your phone, so obviously it's it's far beyond what a normal quote unquote user would do, right? Now a hacker is definitely going to do that because you know, especially if it's like I can't, not allowed to do that. Oh, screw you! Now I'm definitely doing it, you know. Um, but yeah, they're really like they're really like going above and beyond to be able to keep Wallet out of there because they've had such a hard time rolling out ISIS. Um, it's taken so freaking long, and apparently I hear it's. Pile of dumb um, that uh, you know they've been holding off Google Wallet all this time, and it, it has hurt Google Wallet. Um, and overall, it has hurt mobile payments. So this sort of selfish approach um, is, is really set mobile payments back in the U.S. significantly. Um, if you didn't have this sort of thing, it, I, I really feel if Google had not been prevented from having access to Secure Element on Verizon and ATT devices, um, you know, we'd probably see uh, mobile payments being, you know, ten times more ubiquitous in the U.S. than they are right now. Um, but as a result, you know, not a. No. Any other questions? All right, thank you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.